thank you guys for coming. I appreciate it. Uh, my name is Truman Kane. Uh, this is hopefully, you know, you're in the right talk. This is a surveillance detection scout. You look out on autopilot. I'm from a company called Tavora in uh, Southern California in the United States, where I'm a penetration tester. I conduct primarily social engineering penetration tests, so fishing, fishing, uh, physicals, primarily. Part-time developer, I know there's a developer conference, and by part-time, I mean uh, very part-time. So it's primarily after hours, I'm trying to get things done that I either want done for myself or for the company to make things easier uh, for, for myself or my team. Uh, last year, well, I guess uh, there's been two, you know, this very last DEF CON that happened a few months back, and then the DEF CON before that, the first one is where I spoke about Dragnet, social engineering framework that I developed to essentially take any open source data about you and use it against you, sorry, uh, to send phishing emails that you're most likely to click on. And basically, you know, you can OSINT people and get a, a, a huge number of data points about them. We can look back at fish that we've sent, whether they were successful, um, you know, whether the user was exploited through credentials, payload download execution, et cetera. Then we can correlate those uh, data points that we found about them and then, you know, um, look into the future at our next target and see, okay, what's going to work on them. Uh, this last year, I, I created Scout primarily, uh, well, there was a few reasons why. One was to help with physical penetration tests. Two, because it just was cool. Three, I wanted to learn about computer vision. I like Tesla. Full-time Tesla fan, boy, I have to, have to say it there. This, this next screen might include my referral code. Just letting you know. So let's talk about um, Scout. It's essentially turning your car into a mobile surveillance station. So Tesla models S3 and X have the four camera feeds. Uh, the framework is creating this surveillance station comprised of the three main parts. One being the vehicle, that Tesla model S3 or X. Uh, two being the Tesla API. It's unofficial, but Tesla allows you to ping their servers and get uh, rich vehicle data about your vehicle um, while, while it's driving or parked. Um, and then the, the really important part here is the mini computer. Essentially, the computer that's in the Tesla, plugged into it, getting the video uh, as it's written to disk or drive and uh, running inference or essentially doing anything you want it to. It's a computer. It can be as powerful as you want it to be as, uh, as long as it's USB OTG, which we'll get into. Um, it, it can be there accepting the video from the Tesla. So again, the mini computer is responsible for computer vision, the database and uh, the GUI and kind of managing uh, the, the video and, and, the, and the data. So we're going to look at a demo here. Can you guys, if, if you've seen the video demo before, can you raise your hand? Awesome. Okay, I don't know if we... No video through the through the computer. Cool. My name's Truman Kane. We're going to take a quick look at surveillance detection scout. Come on, let's go. I was going to have to narrate this. It's better if you guys so just watch. Let's start with the software component of surveillance detection scout. Now, the recently detected dashboard is a place to see, you know, recently detected license plates and faces. As you can see, scout picks up plates pretty often, so. Although this isn't the most actionable data, you can do some cool things like search by vehicle maker model. The area you probably head to to make better use of all this data, however, is the all plates page. Now here you can see a very small subsampling, just for this demo, of plates that have been detected, along with make and model info, as well as dates of most and least recent detection. Now the table is sorted by number of detections to get you started, and as you can see here, I'm able to dig into these high-risk results to label them benign if it turns out that the vehicle belongs to a friend, neighbor, or coworker. Now, what may stand out is this result with only four detections, yet a high-risk rating. Let's see in the field why that is. Now, if there's a chance you're being followed, you might pull over randomly a few times throughout your drive to let any potential following vehicles pass and to give Scout a chance to detect them. If any following vehicles are detected, you'll see a pop-up on the screen letting you know and you'll see a notification as well on, uh, on your cell phone. Look at that. You just saw the uh, Land Rover Range Rover pass. You see a notification letting us know that uh, this Land Rover has been detected for the fourth time this week. Thanks, Scout. Thanks, Scout. As you just saw, that notification was triggered and this risk rating designated because I had set a threshold for plate detections on four or more days of a given week. 
In the settings area of Surveillance Detection Scout, you can adjust the threshold down to detections on a single drive, up to detections over months. You can even enable thresholds to consider factors like geographical area before alerting you to a potential follow vehicle. After we are alerted, we can come back to the All Plates dashboard and dig into what caused the alert. On the map, we see the routes that we took, and if it makes things easier, we can enable satellite mode, along with place markers where this Land Rover in question was detected. There's corresponding information for each of the detections on the left, and if we click one, we can even see our vehicle status, speed, and power usage at the day and time of detection. I had to rent this vehicle. To make the most Should be the only license plate you see. A serious threat, we can return to the scene with timeline mode. We jump to the area on our route just before this Land Rover was This is one of my favorite parts of the framework. We see the Land Rover pass. So and we can skip ahead a few seconds. We're basically taking that poll data every second, aligning it to where we were, you know, to the video at that very second. So it's really cool. And our geographic location. So those are some of the ways the scout runs counter surveillance while you drive, but it doesn't end there. Now, shooting this sucked. Just want to let you know. That was the best I could get the audio. Now, the satellite's turning on is a native function of Tesla's sensor node. But, when familiar face is detected, you get a notification, just like this one, letting you know of that familiar face. Thanks, Scout. So back here on the recent detections page, or on the all faces page, is where you can easily start putting names to faces. We see the other faces determined to be this person, which we can correct if there's a mistake, but in this case, we'll verify that this is who we think it is by watching the video clip where the detection took place. We'll name this person. And now moving forward, we'll see this name when receiving notifications, or we can disable notifications for this person specifically. I hope you enjoyed this quick preview of Surveillance Detection Scout. Whether you're conducting or evading surveillance. Scout's got your six. That's my tagline. Did anyone notice that that was the R.I.P. Harambe instrumental? No one? Not real Elon fanboys. This is not, I'm not signed into YouTube here. Okay? I don't know. They go by IP. That's all I'm saying. Okay. Let me go back to full screen. Okay, cool. So, if I can get back on here. So, uh, I'm not going to go too much into the web stack, but I will say that it is MongoDB, Vue.js, Express, and Node. And this would have been a lot easier to build using Firebase. I've used Firebase in the past. I'm a huge fan of it. I recommend it for any like hackathon type thing where you're not using super sensitive data. I didn't really feel like giving Google where I am every single second. Uh, I, I'm sure they, they have ways of knowing anyway, uh, but it just seemed like too sensitive a project to open up to cloud uh, infrastructure. So I decided to keep everything local. I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna do that, I basically I wanted everything local for for multiple reasons. I wanted the device to be in the car. I didn't want uh, any location data or uh, detection info or license plate information in the cloud. There's just too many ways that it could be um, misused. Um, so that's why I kept it local. Had to learn about Mongo. Wasn't fun. Got it done. All right, so the, the privacy implications are, are definitely very big. I, I wanted to talk about this right after you saw the video because I'm sure you're thinking, okay, this is a little scary. Um, I think as uh, more self-driving cars get onto the road, the I think we can all agree that the amount of the actionable uh, surveillance data, data is going to skyrocket because it, it, just Teslas are doing this now with, with this many cameras and, and with the um, API that you can hit. I, I imagine other vehicles are going to have these cameras give you access to the video because people are going to ask for it and they'll want to compete. Uh, I mean, that first point kind of is it, self-explanatory. Um, the private corporations and governments wanting this data is, again, one that I think we all can agree on. Uh, law enforcement, insurance companies, market research companies, they're all going uh, to want access to this data. As soon as a murder is solved because of a, the video feed of a um, Tesla that happened to be on the corner, or uh, someone is 
proven at fault in a, in a, in a huge case because of this um, video. They're going to point to those cases and they're going to say, okay, now we need this data. So it's a really um, scary slope that um, I, I wanted to raise attention and awareness around. Um, breaches are going to expose this data because, I mean, I think we've seen uh, huge breaches around market research data. And this is, I, I believe, going to be the same way. So I think the breaches of the future are going to um, include this type of data. And one um, very real scenario that I want to bring up and that I even contemplated before I built, the, when I was in the very early stages of building this, was maybe I offer this um, and, and sell this as a service. I think people, I mean, people have asked me to set the devices up for them, which this is the device, by the way, that we'll get into in a second. Um, I, I think I very easily could have offered a, a paid service around this. I didn't because I, I just... I don't have the infrastructure to, as, a, as one man, make sure that the data is safe, and uh, it just didn't seem worth it in the long run to do that. But if a company, for example, Teslas have third-party, um, there are third-party companies that will create, for example, a wireless charger around, uh, you know, to be compatible with Teslas, for example. If they were to offer this as a little plug-in device, people would buy it. You don't really know who is running that company. You don't know who they have connections to. You don't know how good their security is. All you know is like, wow, it's really easy now to, um, you know, manage my videos. There were all these things that were not fun, not fun or not easy around getting the video off of the Tesla device, seeing the detections. Why did a century event occur? And this makes it easy. Look at this. I can see when my friend passed me. Oh, there's these cool social features. And imagine if it was free. I mean, it's just like, it's just step by step walking you down the path. It's not, it just wouldn't end well. Uh, so that was a, a, a very real a potential scenario that I was hoping to raise awareness around before it actually happened. So you, I'm, I'm sure a few of you heard of um, Nest Cams or Ring Cams, that type of thing. This took some inspiration from, from that. So it's essentially turning your car, it's like a rolling Nest Cam, which is really cool because you have all that rich vehicle data. Um, but a few different uh, potential scenarios before I get to the um, the, pen, the pen testing part is, well, the two are uh, well parked, which cars or vehicle, uh, you know, cars or people are loitering near my car, and two, during your drive. So that would be how long has a car been behind me? Have I seen that car before? The, it, it's just like the data is there. I'm one of those people that has huge FOMO. <laughs> those pull, if you don't pull a Tesla at that second, you, you're never going to get that data back as, as it goes right now. They don't allow you to access that data. So as, as soon as I found that out, I started um, pulling that that data. So I, so I could just know, I want to look at my historical drives. I want to look at how much battery I was using. It, it, it's that, it's the same endpoint you're hitting. Um, so yeah, I just started thinking about what other use cases are there for this type of info. So to the pen testing, um, the, the few recon query scenarios that come to mind are tailgating. I, again, I do physical pen testing during my job. So we could park this at a building and leave it. And we'll get into why Tesla in a second. There are many reasons why the Tesla was the perfect platform for this proof of concept or uh, framework to come together. Park the car there, leave it, come back a day later. If you have it you know, connected to a private server securely, you could hit it o over the web, as assuming you have like a, you know, a, data, a LTE hotspot in there. What time does my target leave, uh, leave or arrive in the morning? For lock picking purposes, you could leave it there and at night know when security is making rounds or when the parking lot's empty or when the building's empty and the lights are off, that type of thing. This is, so it's a very real uh, way that you could make use of this. Another way, I'll grab a drink of water. One other very real scenario that, that you could put into use would be to, okay, let's say we have a target company that we're going to go do a physical pen test on. Go on their LinkedIn, scrape all the profiles, load them into Scout, and essentially, as, assuming the person walks close enough to the car, they're going to be able to tell you, hey, that's Susie, the receptionist, or that's Joe, the receptionist, and they just left for lunch. So it's like you know that the front desk has a higher likelihood than normal of being uh, clear. So what we're going to cover in the rest of this talk is the hardware, the computer vision, the integrations, front end, back end, and anything else that, that kind of falls in between. So getting into why Tesla, the four cameras built in, I believe it's really, it's either, it's either eight or 12. There's so many different parts to this that I've forgotten whether it's eight or 12 um, cameras uh, built in, four that we have access to. When I first started this project, you had access to three, and you also 
couldn't view video in the browser. Now you can view video in the browser, so you can watch that. You, I mean, you, there's even more management uh, features that, that can be built on top of the platform that I haven't yet. Um, but in short, four cameras built in, uh, detailed vehicle owner API, Sentry mode means it's always on. It's an electric vehicle. If you were gonna if you were gonna do this in another car, which you could, it would require quite a bit of modification. It would require third party dash cams. With that being said, the 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 rate of detection would skyrocket because the video quality is much higher on third party dash cams. So there's definitely a pro to to doing that if you were gonna go that route. But with Tesla, it is literally plug and play because those cameras are already mounted there. It's an electric vehicle, so you can leave it on. It wasn't really possible to do this before Sentry mode was released, which allowed you to keep the essentially enhanced alarm system on at all times, which meant the car was on at all times, which meant the video was a rolling hour of video was being saved at all times. And the in-car web browser, so you can see those alerts in real time if you don't want a notification sent uh, to your device. So some of the inspiration around this, well, one of the primary inspirations around the hardware piece was uh, a project on GitHub called Tesla USB. It was originally started by one guy. It was taken over, I think, um, a while back by another guy. But you can Google it. Maybe it's a girl. Not sure. Um, Raspberry Pi Zero W was used. It acts as a flash drive to the Tesla. Th those, those USB ports are where you would normally plug in a flash drive. And that's how you can capture saved events now, sentry, uh, yeah, saved events, sentry events, and uh, recent video. So like I said before, a rolling hour of video is being captured at all times. So if you unplug that USB from your Tesla at any time, you're going to see the last hour of video from all four cameras, and they are in one-minute chunks. And they're about 30 megs each. Uh, but after that hour, you're not going to be able to see something that happened an hour and a minute ago. So that was one thing that wasn't fixed uh, with uh, Tesla USB. You could modify the, the code. I mean, this props to this project and, and the contributors and maintainers because it um, definitely took things a huge step forward and showed what was possible. The transfer speed, so the primary use case for this was essentially so you don't have to unplug the flash drive and uh, plug it into your computer when you get home. That was the, the main use case for this. You get home, you connect your home Wi-Fi, and the video starts transferring to a share, a backup, Google Drive. There were multiple different uh, integrations there, which is awesome. But the transfer speed, I think, was like one, mega, one megabyte a second. Um, it was horrible. Uh, it took a really long time. If you were gone for eight hours, it was, I mean, it was taking a very long time to transfer the video. Again, didn't have the last rolling hour, which you could change with configuration. And um, it just got me thinking about what else could be done now that you essentially can plug a, a computer into your car and, and, and start doing things with that video as soon as the video is written. So that, again, was kind of the FOMO. Um, I really wanted to learn more about computer vision as well. So that kind of went into the inspiration uh, for the project. So some of the requirements for, okay, what I, I want to I do something with this video, and I, 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 I need to get a computer in the car. I, I need it to be better than the Pi Zero, which, again, Pi Zero is a great device, but I just need it to have more uh, better specs. USB OTG, USB on the go. Don't know a whole lot about it. All I really know is that it allows you, it, if something is equipped or enabled with USB OTG, it's going to be able to act as a device to the other device that you're plugging it into. So although the Pi Zero is a computer, it can act as a device, and the Tesla is acting as the host in, in that case. So I, I, I looked at different options, and I knew that the option needed to have GPU or TPU so I could do, uh, you know, run computer vision or inference on, on the video that's coming in. Um, Google Coral uh, Dev Board was an option. NVIDIA Jetson Line was not was an option with their Nano and Xavier. Um, Nano, I think, is like $100 or $150. Xavier is about uh, $700, roughly. I wanted thing, the inference to be as fast as possible just to see what could be done on the top end without straight up just plugging a computer in. So I went with, the, you know, a, full, a, a workstation in, so I went with the uh, Xavier um, for most of this. The, the parts that you need, along with just the Jets and Xavier, are the wireless adapter and antennas, USB-C uh, uh, ch car charger and cable, got a typo there, and a one terabyte uh, SSD. You could go, I think, bigger if you, if you want. Um, one terabyte is the minimum I, I would recommend because if you're gone for 
maybe a one or two day trip, you don't want to have to, you don't want to, you know, run out of space basically. So this is a device. This is a 3D printed uh, case. I, I, I need to include the link in the repo. I didn't include it here either. Here's the antennas that plug in um, or, or screw in through that case. So that's the device. It's pretty small. Fits in the glove box or center console of the Tesla. So I'll talk briefly about real time being defined. And, I, and there was a little bit of magic, but really not too much with the videos that you saw because it's like, okay, the, the detection came up before the car drove past. What the heck, dude? Um, those were assuming that so we you don't know it's not it's not they try to tesla tries to but it's not like every minute on the minute the video is being written sometimes there's an offset of a few seconds so there's a little bit of luck of the draw as uh, in regards to when the person walks past and when that video file is going to actually be finished and written for that minute so those are assuming that the person walked past the video file ended a second later the file was written to disk because the inference can't start until that mp4 hits disk i'm trying to work on it if anyone has suggestions please let me know a way that i can pull those frames while the file is being written because that would allow us to run the inference truly in real time and i know it's not disk it's a solid state drive so some of the integrations that we were dealing with here were the uh, tesla rest api if this then that i know that's a third-party service but um, i'm not including I guess you could blur the picture before you send it through. And, yeah, basically, if this and that's the closest to a third-party cloud service that I'm including in this, and all it is doing is giving you a notification to your phone that, that you're being followed, telling you the type of card it is. A map box is just for the, for the map on the GUI, uh, the styles. License plate make and model lookups. We're not, um, you know, not a, a officially supported by any means. I had to uh, run a few websites through Burp and find one that would allow me to pull that data. I would imagine that it, it's not going to work forever. Um, there are definitely third-party services you can plug into where you're paying uh, for just about all this stuff, uh, but I wanted to keep it open source free for this proof of concept to, to show what's possible with outside of the hardware um, free services in, that, are, that are relatively secure. OpenStreetMap for the reverse uh, geocoding. Again, there's ray limits on allowing us to pull, hey, the, here's, the geo here's the coordinates, what street and what city and what zip code I is this. I think it's like once every three seconds you can pull that data, which is fine because you're usually not, you're not moving too much. And when you are moving, you're not moving multiple streets or, you know, within three seconds is, is where I set it. So you're always going to have a, a, a very realistic um, waypoint of what street you're on, that type of thing. So to get into the code, just starting at the beginning, okay, I want to build this. What's the first thing I have to do? start polling, getting that data uh, on, you know, the, the data with location, heading, speed, gear or status, acceleration levels, so you can create that um, timeline, you, that look back uh, and, and essentially know where the car is and what it's doing. Enriching the uh, geocode data every few seconds, again, if it's noticing, okay, this is the same street, this is the same geocode code that's returned back to us from OpenStreetMap, we're going to wait. Um, uh, and then uh, creating drives programmatically. There are a few, like Tesla Stats app and others. I thought that, it, I guess it, it doesn't make sense that Tesla's going to provide you, hey, this is a drive and all the data points that go along with it, because, again, they're only providing it to you right at that point, and then it's gone. So we had to create a method of creating drives for a look back so that you could see the actual path that you took. So we'll try to get to the code here. i got to close this. Cool. Okay, so essentially, uh, there's a, a repo or a, a project called Tesla JS that this is pulled from. I'm, I'm just modifying one of, or uh, I'm really pulling a lot of code from Tesla JS repo. So major props to the contributors there. Adding in a cron job so that we can run this uh, essentially every second. We're using Mongoose to interact with the MongoDB here, creating or declaring some schema types for drive, geocode, and poll. Poll is like the what I call the main, okay, this is a poll. This is for this second what was happening. And we can see we got timestamp, heading, location, street, bless you, uh, Unix, etc., or uh, timestamp, etc. This is kind of boilerplate here. Here's where we're saying, okay, every second we want to run this. 
here's where we're declaring some globals so that we can either write things. If we're trying to do a little bit of time saving and um, trying to be smart as far as making sure we don't error out, uh, basically. So if this is the first time we're running this, we're going to get the get the geocode for the first time. We're going to add that to the global so that we have a geocode for the for the first um, uh, poll that we're that we're adding to to Mongo. Here is where we're determining. Okay, do we need to create a new drive around this or not? If someone just turns this on, starts pulling, there's there's no drive ID yet, and if they if they turn this on while they're in drive, it's th there's a bunch of ways that this can break, and and it has, and. Like I said, I'm a part-time dev, and I only found, I only started implementing tries and accepts a few weeks ago <laughs> on some of the stuff. So, yeah, it's not not ideal from a development standpoint. Again, pull request uh, welcome. Basically, we're saying okay, if the last state was parked and the current state is not parked, then this is a new drive um, because they're either in reverse or they're in. You know, we we don't want to have a bunch of points of just it, of, of just being parked. Uh, and we definitely don't want those to be included in a drive. So that's why we're, we're trying to find out when we need to create a new drive. And, and it's basically when we've been parked, now we're reversing or we're driving forward. We don't need that last data point where we were parked. It's, we're right there. It's a second later. That's going to be the first point of the new drive. So we're going to create the new drive right here. We're going to save that document to the Mongo database. And we're going to have that ID. We're going to add this to the global variable for that drive ID. We're going to be able to write this new poll, and we're going to include the drive ID. Okay. Here is where we just parked, and this is the last poll of this drive. We're going to end the drive here. So the last state was not parked. It was not blank. I'm just doing some trying to fix some errors here, and now the state is parked. I mean, pretty self-explanatory. Pretty simple. So we're going to update that drive with the end heading location and time because you know we have the ID from the global. We're going to create a new poll and we're going to save it. If we're in a drive, you know the state's not equal to parked and this is in an else, so it's not either the two above for sure. It's not, you know, the, the gear or status is not parked. We're going to find out if we need to get a geocode. has been more than three seconds. That's just doing a little bit of um, you know, math right here. We have our user agent, which, again, which uh, OpenStreetMap essentially requires. You're going to get blocked. So we're hitting the endpoint here. Requires you to be for, requires the Xavier to be connected to your um, mobile hotspot to do this. You could do it after the fact. But again, for this proof of concept, I wanted to show everything done uh, being local and in real time. So we're going to turn th this return here into a, a geocode. We're going to save that. It's going to give us things like road, city, the things you saw in the demo. And we're going to create a new poll, including that info. If we have you know, a geocode that we got in the last three seconds, we're going to use that. We're not going to have to pull uh, from the website. And I think this is just more error, you know, else, et cetera, type stuff. Cool. I think I'll just click to the next one here. Okay, so step two, after we have that data being written to Mongo, we want to grab all of the video and we want to prepare it for inference. So... We have cron tab here, and again, this is requiring you to. I didn't. I, I, I didn't go, or you know, I didn't plan on going into in this talk how to actually set up the partitions on the Xavier so that you can, you know, allocate 500 gigs to this or 200 gigs to that. That's assuming you've already done that. There are instructions for it in the GitHub repo. So the cron tab is essentially saying, okay, every 30 seconds we want to run a check copy script. This check copy script is unmounting, waiting, and then mounting. The, U, the USB flash drive, that allocation that is plugged into the Tesla currently, it's mounting that here as well. Definitely a situation where you could deal with some errors, memory loss, file corruption, that type of thing. I haven't dealt with too much of it at, at all, uh, but 
if this is a highly experimental uh, software and project, and I'm happy I, this reminds me to put in the disclaimer of follow your local laws. I'm not responsible if data goes missing. You know, the 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 thing that I would you know really want to avoid would be in that rare one second where something doesn't work for some reason, there's an accident, and you're like, I really need this footage. So just keep that in mind, that this is experimental and, and should be used in, in, an, in an experimental fashion. Okay, so we're mounting it. We're going into the three folders that Tesla requires you to create. And I think I can go to... my finder here. Maybe not. So there's three folders that Tesla requires you to create. Recent clips, sentry clips, and saved clips. Saved clips is when you're driving, you see something happen. Oh, look at that. Press the button. The last 10 minutes of video for those four cameras is saved. It's saved into a folder. Recent clips is a list of the four videos, you know, one for each camera, of the last hour. There's no folders, just a bunch of video clips. Sentry clips, again, back to the folder method of Here's an event that occurred. You weren't there. Someone walked by super close to your car. We, we captured a clip. It's the last 10 minutes. It's in a folder that it, with a timestamp basically in the name of, of when that, that took place. So we're going into each of those folders, recent clips, entry clips, and save clips. We're checking a list that we've created, uh, recent files.txt, save folders.txt, or century folders.txt. We're seeing if we've already written to that. If we haven't, then we're going to, okay, this is a new video that we want to move over so that we don't lose it. And once we move it over, which I'll get to in a second, we're writing that file name to one of those three files so that we know not to copy it over again. Pretty simple. We're getting rid of, we're getting rid of any errors in this video. We're rewriting it using FFmpeg because a few of you may know that sometimes there's corruption in these files. They won't play in certain browsers that, you know, that, the videos will be corrupt some of the time from Tesla. It, they blame it on the USB flash drive that you're using. I've used from great to not so great flash drives. I've dealt with the corruption issues with all of them. So I don't know if that's just me and I have bad luck. But this gets rid of it completely uh, with FFmpeg. You run that error detect uh, flag, ignore error. I don't know. That's just the line that works to move that uh, video file over. Then we're going to remove the video from the... Um, portion of storage that is alloc that the Tesla is using so that we don't run out of storage essentially. So next, okay, so here is a, a finder window where you can see this is the, the folder system and how it looks. With recent clips, we've just got a list of video files. Save clips, we've got a list of folders. And then video files and sentry clips, again, list of folders there. So we're going to prepare for inference. We'll go back. We've done check copy. We've moved things over into a, a videos directory. Tesla drive slash videos. That's where all of the new video files are going. We have a watcher with Python watchdog running. And any time a video lands in the videos directory, I'm going to have to speed myself up here a little bit. Uh, we're, going, we're going to prepare it for inference. How we're going to do that is essentially pass that <laughs> source to preprocess.sh that file path. Here's where we're going to turn that video into frames. That's kind of all we're doing. But what we're doing is there's, there's too many frames. You can't run inference on all of them. There's just too many. It would take way too long, especially with this device. So we're using what are called iframes. I'm not an expert on this either. I had to learn about it. Uh, basically, they're, as far as I understand, they're the frames where it's not a frame that's in between. It's not an in-between frame is how I understood it. Um, it. It moves things from, I think it's 21, uh, over 2,000 frames down to, I think it's um, 240 frames or 3,600 frames. I gotta, I gotta go back to my slide here because I have a note about it. Okay, it's 2160. That's the amount of frames for one video. After you get the iframes, it's turning into 240. Then we're, we're saying we don't need all those frames, so we're gonna grab one in every four of those. You could move that up, but detection again is gonna take longer. You can manage that in settings, and that's going to allow you to have uh, 60 frames. I mean, yeah, you're really cutting down on the, uh, um, um, you know, time for detection. So we have all the pre-processing done. We're, now we're ready to start inference. Let me see if I have a note on this one. 
So we're going to let inference begin, and we're using TensorFlow. TensorRT, which is making TensorFlow work with the NVIDIA system. Uh, YOLO, V3, Darknet. I believe there's some Keras in there as well. So the first, again, this is run, This is Watchdog that's just sitting here waiting for anything to be passed to the, video, the, um, the frames file, uh, the frames directory, because preprocess.sh is passing those frames to the frames directory. As soon as anything lands there, we've already preloaded all of our models, because that's something, if you have any familiarity with computer vision, the preloading of the models takes quite a while. We don't want to have to do that every time. That's why we use a watcher, is because we can do that preloading up front, now the watcher is just sitting there, model preloaded, ready to accept a frame that comes in. And so what we're looking for from here is an output of either people or vehicles. And we're using a YOLO V3 again just right out of the box because it allows us to see a car, bus, or person. So that's, that's pretty cool. Um, if we see a... I'm going to grab a drink here. If we see a person or a car, we're going to cut them out of the frame and we're going to pass them to either a directory for people or vehicles. So we're not doing much here in terms of are they too small to recognize except for right here. We see, okay, this is for a person. If the width of the cropped person from this image is uh, greater than 320, then write it. If it's not, then it's very unlikely we're going to be able to see the face of this person. It's just going to waste time to pass that image to FaceNet, which we're using for uh, the face facial recognition. So we're not even going to we're not even going to do it. It would just slow everything down. So we're taking some of that into account. I'm sure there's a lot more I could do on that front. Uh, here with plates or with cars, we're not doing that, but I I definitely could add it there. So we're going to go to license plate detection. So now we see a vehicle, we've cropped it, we've passed it to vehicles. Some of these land in vehicles, which is what we're watching right here with watch, uh, Watchdog. And we have our model preloaded here as well. These are all running at the same time, uh, by the way. So models preloaded, they're just waiting for files to land in the proper directory to start working on or running inference on them. So here we use a custom trained YOLO v3. I took, I think is like Google Net or open images data set or something like that had a bunch of license plates custom trained uh, yolo v3 just, just you know strictly for license plates in in this instance because i wanted it to be able to detect those very quickly so that's what we do and here is where we're doing again some of that handling around okay i don't want to write the i don't want to start ocr on this uh, the character recognition because the plate is just is too small that there's a very high likelihood we are not going to be able to read this plate. So that's where some of that um, handling uh, is coming into play. Otherwise, we're writing it, and we are writing it to a, I think it's called plates. Uh, yep, a plates directory. Okay, so then we're going to run OCR on it. So something has landed here, and here's where we're basically doing the running the OCR, which major props to ALPR unconstrained is the repo that I used for uh, the uh, the OCR. You can pass an image uh, or I think video to them, and they'll do everything from the car to the plate to the OCR. But I, it wasn't going to work in the way that I wanted to as quickly as I wanted to work uh, with the faces as well. So I didn't go that route. Uh, but that's what I use. I used um, all their work for the OCR. And if we do have a detection, and in the U.S. it's you know, seven. Basically, this is going to. Uh, depend somewhat on which state, location, country, area you're from. So you can you can edit things there. That's the threshold you're going to get. Um, that's what I said. Okay, I, I only want to run OCR on, or I, you know, if I don't want to write a document to MongoDB if what they're coming back as reading on that plate is not seven characters because it's wrong. It's, it's for sure not a, you know the correct license plate if it's over or under seven characters. If I know that the plates where I'm at are seven. So here's where we're writing uh, the detection. Here's just a bunch of stuff where I'm um, messing with the file name to... Because before, I didn't want to worry about it, but now I do. And uh, each file is basically has a timestamp in it. I think we can go back to here and see. And any of that green you're seeing on those little uh, video thumbnails is essentially corrupted frames. So it's a real thing. Here we can see that the timestamp is here. So we see like 2019, 10, 24, October 24th at 1.30 and 46 seconds back camera. 
And then by knowing what frame it is, because we have which frame in this video file that we got the detection out of, we can then count those. We can divide by four. We can count those frames, and we know, okay, this is the exact second that this detection took place. So that's what a lot of this is doing. And then if we don't have a geocode, I need to remove this because some of the code has changed. And now we're doing everything within three seconds from poll.js. But if we needed a geocode, we could pull it from here as well. This is the type of, basically it's saying, okay, we have a plate here. Is it, is it an existing plate? We're going to assume it's not an existing plate. So we're going to write a new one. Now we're going to hit <laughs> Carfax. Didn't remove that. Sorry, Carfax. Uh, or auto check. Again, not officially endorsed. So that's where you're going to be able to, for example, hypothetically get a make and model from. And that's how you can populate OK. Now we not only have a detection, but we have an actual plate. And here's the make and model. And it's in its own collection in MongoDB. And so once that's written, OK, now we have a new plate in, in Mongo. We can write a new detection around it. And that's going to be right here. And we're going to, uh, copying a lot of data, probably don't need to. You can probably do like reference types, uh, you know, uh, refer to this document for the poll, that type of thing. Uh, Definitely, I'm sure, a better way to do a lot of this, but this is how I got it working. So, um, so we're rewriting a lot of data here. Um, essentially, a lot of the poll data, as well as, okay, here's the detection image path, vehicle image path, seconds into video, etc. Now for, and here's some error handling as well. So we're going to look at, essentially in vehicle detection, it's not just vehicle detection, it's vehicle or person detection. If we see a person, we're going to pass it to Facenet. And here is a modified um, predict.py from Facenet. I basically had to come up with an example first. I took, took a picture of like, um, just someone completely random, a celebrity. And at the very beginning, before you have a model trained with any faces, said, does this person look more like this example you know, what's the probability that this, this is the example? I think I said it at 60%, something like that. And if, it, if it's coming back and saying, yep, this is, the, you know, this is the sample image, again, we've already seen all this, then right here. So if the best guess is that that person is a sample, we know it's a new face. That was the best way I could come up with to say. And still have this model preloaded uh, was, was by using this method here. So again, we're going to write a face in the same way that we were writing the plate. Uh, gender and age setup is, is to come soon. Writing that face, writing the pull around it. So let me see what else we got here because I know I'm running a little bit low on time. Open ALPR uh, was something I messed with at the beginning. The paid option was the only one that's worth it. There are a lot of paid options that are going to be way better uh, than, than the, the free ones. Uh, just, just throwing that out there. We already looked at uh, writing detections. So to alert or not to alert, that's the next step of this that needs to be written into. There are multiple branches of this. You need to combine a few things and essentially the detection thresholds for alerting. That's the important part. When am I actually going to see you know, an alert in regards to this stuff? And the ways you can do it are X detections in Y, Zs is the best way I could explain it. For example, four detections in one week was the example we saw in the demo. X is going to be an integer. Y is going to be an integer. Z is going to be either drives, hours, days, weeks, months, or total. And so with that combination, you can really set up as many types of alert thresholds as you want to. It gives you a lot of control. Um, I mean, you could even set it on vehicles or plates, for that matter, with uh, very little modification. The other would be inbounds or out-of-bounds alerts based off of your zip code. So I want to be alerted when a vehicle is detected within the zip code that I live in, and only if it is also detected outside of that zip code. That's um, something that was passed to me as an example from someone in law, in law enforcement. So I think it's a, a real one is, you know, if you're really being followed, it, that would be a, a real way to tell. So to improve on Scout, the time waster checks early on, again, we could do a lot more in uh, vehicle detection or even in uh, plate detection uh, in regards to size of the images. 
basically just to save some of the time. It's it's going to come down to how instantaneously you want um, to be alerted because you're going to miss some things if you do that type of thing. You know, if you let the OCR or you let FaceNet run on every single frame, it's just a fact that you're going to see more detections, uh, real detections as a result. Uh, minimizing the false positives and near misses, this is an example I'm fighting through right now, is, okay, the license plate is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Another license plate detection occurred a second later, and it's 1, 1, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And another one after that, a, a letter or, or number off. That's um, something that could very quickly be fixed. And, you know, set another global or set a, a global array and, and track the last few detections and say, is, is this one that we're seeing now only one or two digits off of the last one that we saw? If yes, and if, well, you know, that's one way you could do it. Another way you could do it is wait until the actual, um, you know, every minute or so or every two minutes or so what is the most what is the detection or the plate that has the most detections for it there's these three you know plate names or you know plate numbers that are very similar which one has the most detections to it does that one also have a return with the make and model from uh, from this website we're hitting if yes that is likely the real one pass the others to that plate and, and get rid of the new plates you created for them that's how you do that uh, the faster inference in general, I'm sure there's a better way to do it uh, with um, tensor RTs. I need to dig into that. Uh, they, uh, NVIDIA is cool, and I'm sure the reason they're doing it is they want you to stay in their platform, in their ecosystem, but they definitely there's a huge amount of resources out there uh, for doing this type of stuff with NVIDIA uh, hardware. And, of course, uh, pull requests. Welcome. So that is it. Thank you very much. You can see the code walk through that type of thing on threat.devora.com slash scout. And we have a few minutes left. If there are any questions, I will try to remember to repeat the questions. Otherwise, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Thanks. Sweet. Yes? Um, how do you power the media? Mm -hmm. So you could use an additional battery, but you, thank you, see, <laughs> lucky to have you here. So what you asked was, how would you, how, how are we powering the hardware? Uh, is it through a battery or is it uh, via the car? And I think we can go back here to uh, one of the, or one of the two pieces that, both of the pieces that you'll need to power through the car would be the USB-C cable in the middle there, as well as the car charger. You might need an adapter, not sure. Um, but you can power through a battery. The thing is, it's, you're, you're not going to be able to run the hardware at full speed, um, not even close, because you need 30 watts to uh, run the hardware at, at a decent point to get detections done relatively quickly. That's why I recommend going through the car instead of a um, you know, battery. Yep. Yes? To what degree would your setup already work with a, a Nano? With the Nano, I believe, so what you asked was, uh, to what degree would the, this setup work on a Jetson Nano? Relatively same ecosystem. I haven't tested it. I think it would work to a high degree. I have a Nano. I need to, to test it. I think some of the issues you'd run into are it just building up a huge backlog of video that needs to be sorted through. You know, when you get home, not, not knowing about detection until hours later. And yeah, I think it would, it would just be a, just a huge backlog. It would take a while. I think it, it might potentially be worth it in that case to to wait until you get home. If you have a GPU workstation, you know that would be it would just crank through the video. If for for real real time, I think it's it's a requirement to have the uh, Xavier. Now there could potentially be. So I think you'd end up using a models um, like ti like I think it's Yolo Tiny or Tiny Yolo. Those would probably be the way to go. And there's probably people out there that know of ways that we can really speed up. Uh, the inference by using different models, that type of thing, or doing some, you know, some, tr you know, some tricks w in regards to the inference to save quite a bit of time. You know, I haven't tested it, but one of the things I want to test is um, looking at two images or two frames and saying, is there a, a major difference between these? If not, don't do any detection because we just ran it on the same frame. I mean, that's going to cut all of that out. And if you're stopped at a stoplight, that's, it's a very real thing that I was seeing was when you're at a stoplight, you're getting all these detections. It's the same thing. 
There's no reason to run those detections. So by doing that type of programming, it, it makes it a lot more realistic that you'll be able to run it on um, nano or other uh, lighter weight hardware. Yeah, thanks. Anyone else? Cool. Yeah, if you have, you see me around. Yeah, go ahead. What about, what about the TensorFlow models that you have used? Did you have to train them yourself? Did you have or did you use something that you, for instance, the TensorFlow model for recognizing the license plates? Mm -hmm. What was the, the process for building that? Have you used some open source already trained model? Did you have to train it yourself? Did you have to adjust it yourself? Because I assume that uh, uh, different uh, input sources for different countries might. So if I use, uh, I don't know, uh, plates from Germany mm -hmm. as to train the model, then maybe in France I will not be able to mm -hmm. accurately. Them, so. Yep. What, what, what did you use there? How challenging was it? Challenging was it? So I think the base, basis of your question was, did I use a completely custom, did I have to custom train this model from scratch? How difficult was it in regards to the uh, license plate detection? Uh, the, I, I want to say for sure it was the open images data set that I used. And it's a collection, there, it's a collection for object detection uh, research. and. I, I specifically looked in this collection, and I just wanted license plate pictures, and it uses license plates from all countries. At first, I was tagging these images individually. I had interns helping me out. We're going letter by letter. It was horrible, and uh, I thought I was making huge progress. We got this workstation set up. I was like, Kevin, to my manager, I was like, this is crazy. We got the GPU cracking. It's just running through the stuff. It's, it's like you know, letter for letter picking all the stuff up. No, that was the control. I was totally off. It was not working at all. It was taking forever. It would have taken thousands, hundreds of thousands of images. Well, this open images data set gives you that, and it's for all countries. It was extremely easy. Following a t tutorial I found online, it was, I think, Le Learn OpenCV or something, something along those lines, or Learn Computer Vision, one of those types of sites. Um, how, to cu how to custom train a YOLO, YOLO V3. If you Google that, you'll see it. It'll be one of the top ones. And he walks you through the steps. He even points you to the, and I think he uses Snowman was his example, so that's definitely a way you'd find that tutorial. I, trained it, I changed it from Snowman to License Plate. wasn't a huge um, change from there. It was, it was very easy in, you know, in relation to the rest of this what, framework. What's the accuracy that you have uh, in recognizing the license plate? Accuracy? The accuracy percentage. So that is going to come down to ALPR unconstrained and how clear the image is. It's just a matter of how many feet closer are we. If it's close enough that the, that the plate is clear, it's going to pick it up. It's very high accuracy. I can't give you a number because it really just depends on how clear the frame is. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, again, to reiterate the question you asked was, um, what was the accuracy in regards to uh, the OCR on license plates? Okay. What about the face, the face detection? What, what, I, I made most, uh, what did you use and for the face detection in order to get the face ID? What, what library did you use? For the face detection, I used the FaceNet, um, FaceNet project, yeah, through GitHub. Trained it on, I think, I, I took, so I did take a, a pre-trained model there. It's like a .pb that you download. You have that. Custom training on your own faces, your own library you can set up. Essentially, it's creating a folder directory setup on the, on the you know, actual subdirectories for each person, and then moving detections into those subdirectories, and then retraining the model based off those directories. So, for example, if you write a face and then you, you know, another face is written, a new detection, and it doesn't think it's Joey, it thinks it's Jimmy, but it's really Joey, you change that face, it's literally moving that detection image on the subdirectory into Joey or Jimmy or whoever's bad name examples. It, my time's up. I got to Sorry. We'll talk after. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank you.